Chapter 1. Death is an essential part of life, and discussing it is not to be avoided. In this summary, you will learn about Dr. Rachel Clark's life, her thoughts, beliefs, medical journey, successes, and failures. Today, it is possible to live an extended life thanks to scientific advancements. Over 100 years ago, the human death rate was very high due to limited health solutions and scientific inventions, but now, more humans believe and rely on their doctors and medical intervention. Amid these growing technologies in medicine, Dr. Rachel Clark chose to specialize in palliative health care, a specialty that most avoid. Death hovers around palliative medicine, which is a sad, emotional, boring, and challenging experience. But Dr. Clark made her decision and realized that the part of the hospital that allowed her to flourish as a doctor was the ward most avoided, the inpatient palliative care unit. What dominates palliative medicine is not the closeness to death or the thought of death, but the best of the living. Unlike popular thoughts, kindness, courage, love, and tenderness are the qualities that often emanate from a person in their last days. The idea of death can be disturbing, frustrating, chaotic, messy, and almost violent with grief. Still, many often accept that death is inevitable, and they try as much as possible to enjoy the last days of their lives. Unlike what many think, dying is the essence of living a beautiful, bittersweet, and fragile life. This summary elaborates on the need to accept death as part of living and be prepared for it. The chapters in this summary further explain the job of palliative doctors as end-of-life caregivers and easers of pain in dying patients. It also discusses the dilemma of palliative healthcare doctors when having to influence a dying patient to accept that they are going to die. Those who love and lose are always connected by heartstrings into infinity. Terry Gillimitz, Chapter 2 Dr. Clark learned empathy and relating with patients after she was diagnosed with CIN. American playwright and teacher Margaret Edson, who once worked in an oncology department, wrote a drama about cancer entitled Wit. It was shown to Dr. Clark on her very first day at medical school. In 1999, Margaret Edson was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for the drama Wit. The drama was about Vivian Baring, a strong and intelligent American professor diagnosed with late-stage ovarian cancer. She had to continually undergo grueling treatment with experimental trial drugs. The play described the loss of control and lack of choice that patients typically feel upon admission to the hospital. Cancer patients are stripped when necessary and scrutinized by doctors, often without knowing what the doctors are doing. Vivian endured all sorts of inevitable side effects, such as vomiting, pain, loss of hair, and humiliation as a side effect of the chemotherapy. At one point, she realized the doctors were using her body as an experimental object to learn more about her condition. The play caused Dr. Clark to consider her future power as a doctor. It also made her see herself through the eyes of a patient. When Dr. Clark was diagnosed with CIN, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, she felt helpless and believed she could face the same fate as female patients who had similar ailments. The thoughts of the cervical procedure she had to go through gave her more fear. A few days after the diagnosis, Dr. Clark went to the colonoscopy clinic feeling vulnerable as she had switched from being a professional to becoming a patient. Seeing Dr. Clark's worried state, the gynecologist asked her if he could treat her as a medical student and not as a patient. Dr. Clark was grateful for this and it eased her fears. Diathermy, a process of using electricity to heat metals to create surgical tools that sculpt and sear simultaneously, was used to minimize blood loss in Dr. Clark's procedure. The nurses were kind to her when she was in so much pain that it made her tremble. Dr. Clark appreciated the gesture and realized that small acts of kindness and a simple human touch could help patients overcome their primal fear. Did you know? CIN is a set of deformed, misshapen cells that can transform into cancer if left untreated. Chapter 3. CPR isn't for everyone. Letting the frail go is a better decision. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, the medical term for reviving a dying heart, can be miraculous when it works as intended. It is a form of grabbing patients or snatching their lives back. However, despite the invention of CPR, cardiac arrest ceases to be a reversible state at some point in life and becomes the natural and inevitable moment of death. Sometimes the heart stops because it is time for the individual to go. CPR in cases like this is pointless and just inhumane. It becomes a great challenge for doctors to know those they can save from those who should be left alone. No one learns this in medical school, and no training discusses how difficult the task is. Resuscitation typically involves a team of doctors forcing a dead body to resurrect. 
If a patient suffers cardiac arrest and no CPR form was filled hitherto, stating if the patient wants CPR or not, the default response is resuscitation. A crash team descends with full force, pumping the chest of the patient, shocking the heart, doing whatever is necessary to bring the patient back to life. However, resuscitation is usually avoided if the patient is too elderly, frail, or overwhelmed with illness and may never stand a chance if made to go through the rigorous process, so they usually are left to go peacefully. In cases where death is inevitable, the kindness and best course of action is to end the individual's life with sedation, injecting a large dose of morphine or midazolam into a human's vein as quickly as possible. Did you know? Do not attempt cardio pulmonary resuscitation discussions allow patients to consider whether they would want CPR. Their wishes, noted in their patient record, helps guide clinicians in an emergency when the patient no longer possesses the capacity to decide for themselves. Chapter 4. Palliative Medicine is a wake-up call to treat dying patients better. When ill, everyone wants the hospital to be a place of warmth, safety, and love. But sadly, a lot of hospitals fall short. As much as some hospital workers are friendly and kind, patients still suffer unintentionally in their hands. Dr. Clark decided to focus on palliative medicine after observing how some doctors dispatched their patients to palliative care. Earlier, hematology had been her dream specialty. She'd been intrigued by the unpredictable stories of blood cancers, as well as the life and death conversations with patients. She observed that once an illness entered the terminal phase, doctors deemed human lives no longer worth engaging. So, despite her love for medicine and saving lives, Dr. Clark found herself drawn to palliative medicine a practice mostly unwanted. Another factor that spurred her willingness to remain in palliative medicine is that so many deaths in the hospital are uglier than they should have been. Dr. Clark believes that things can be done better and that palliative medicine is one department in the hospital where she could be fulfilled. Palliative medicine has also made her think of how better to comfort patients and how best to speak about the issue of death. Good palliative care ensures that no one suffers when they die. The Latin verb palliare meaning to cloak, further explains that the primary aim of palliative medicine is to suppress or cover up the symptoms of dying. A good palliative care doctor helps a dying patient live through the remaining days of their life in gladness. Grief is like the ocean. It comes in waves, ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water is calm and sometimes overwhelming. All we can do is learn to swim. Vicki Harrison, Chapter 5, The Job of Palliative Palliative care doctors is not to save lives, but to help dying patients accept their fate. Dr. Clark almost lost her son, Finn, when he was four years old. She had gone out with him to get provisions. Trying to keep hold of Finn's hand in the crowd had been tough. Before she knew it, she had lost him in the crowd. She almost lost her mind searching for him, but eventually found him at the fish counter. This occurrence reminded her of how strong human survival instincts are. No one wants to die. The job of palliative care doctors is not the extension of life or the struggle to fight off the inevitable, but it is the acceptance of what cannot be controlled and encouraging others to do the same. What dominates palliative medicine is not the proximity to death, but the best bits of living. Dr. Clark told the story of Joe, a patient who ended up in palliative care. He had been diagnosed with melanoma, the most malignant of all skin cancers. The patient had been struggling to undergo immunotherapy continuously until his body could no longer take it. Dr. Clark had the difficult job of breaking the news to him and his family that his cancer could no longer be controlled and that he had limited time to live. It was hard for her, but her job was to disillusion the patient and help him accept what the future held. This she eventually did, but it was one of the hardest conversations she'd ever had. Immunotherapy is a kind of cancer treatment that helps an individual's immune system fight against the disease. Living in denial when it comes to death isn't a crime. However, it is advised that you prepare for your demise as you age. Death can come at any time. Preparing in advance may be a bit scary, but it helps you set things rolling so your family won't have to make guesses. Preparing early means writing your will, making your death wishes, putting your business processes in order, leaving a legacy, and so on. Did you know? According to a 2021 survey by Caring.com, the number of young adults with a will increased by 63% since 2020. Chapter 6. Accepting and talking about death helps you prepare for it when it eventually happens. Today, we live longer and better than at any other point in human history because of advanced medicine and science. However, this doesn't change the fact that death is imminent once the body rejects treatment. 
Dr. Clark lost her father to colorectal cancer. The man was also a doctor, just like her. At the initial stages of his diagnosis and treatment, she supported him by being calm and dispassionate instead of anxious. She was fully aware that doctors should never treat anyone close to them, so she didn't let the daughter in her affect his treatment. Emotional entanglements can cause distorting medical judgments. Dr. Clark tried to suppress her opinions by letting her dad explore and develop his own treatment as she did with other patients. Throughout his chemotherapy, he kept hoping that he would make it, despite having stage 4 cancer. Sadly, after his first three months of chemotherapy, the cancer still couldn't be controlled. It continued to spread. At that point, he knew that it was time to accept his fate, which made Dr. Clark even more proud of her father. Dr. Clark's father, Dr. Finn Clark, refused to continue treatment or be stuck in a hospital bed. He instead returned home to spend the remaining days of his life happy with his family. It is one of the most memorable experiences Dr. Clark shares about her life. Her father's story gave her more courage to tell her patients to accept their fate after all is done and death seems imminent. She also respected and appreciated her father more for being courageous till death. Did you know, angor anami is a Latin word for a terrible sensation that accompanies the conviction that you are dying. Its symptoms include a racing pulse, high blood pressure, and deoxygenated lips. Conclusion. Death makes us love life, which is why the thoughts of death usually bring about anxiety and the struggle to live at all costs. When a patient is dying, unless they have stated otherwise, CPR is carried out to resurrect and restart their heart. However, if the patient is too elderly, weak, and overwhelmed with illness, their heartbeat may never be restored with CPR. If doctors try, they will only cause the patient to die painfully. But new things are being invented daily, and who knows, a machine might be created soon to perform seamless CPR for all patients. One vital takeaway from this summary is that it's good to accept fate and not live in denial when told that death is imminent. In recent times, newspaper columns, television documentaries, and social media campaigns now urge more people to talk about dying. Opening up about dying has its rewards. Some patients find relief and fulfillment when allowed to talk about their deaths. However, there are still a handful of patients who never comply but continue to live in denial. It is the work of every palliative care doctor to encourage and influence dying patients to embrace facts and make use of their time wisely. As people age, they begin to have various health challenges that usually threaten to take their lives away. No matter how we see it, our time here is short. It's best to live a healthy life and be well informed about your well-being. If you can, forgive as well as forget offenses. Avoid being bitter, sour-hearted, surly, and cynical. Only engage in activities that will prolong your life. Try this. Visit a palliative health care center and help dying patients enjoy the rest of their lives. Play games with them. Read them a story. Pray with them. Or comfort their families.